That was my last time that I saw Big. And he was crying. He said, they shot Big. He was in the passenger seat. I was in the seat behind him. 26 years ago, we tragically lost one of the greatest music artists that ever lived. In the sphere of hip hop, Christopher Wallace, AKA the Notorious B.I.G., is revered as one of the greatest of all time writer, rapper, and songwriters, a GOAT. His final body of work was the impeccable double album, Life After Death, a succession of infectious hit records and impossibly poignant rhymes that soared from certified diamond to iconic. 2022 marked the year that Life After Death turned 25, as well as the year that our dear friend Big Papa would have been 50 years old. I'm Angie Martinez, the voice of New York, and I spent five consecutive nights speaking with those who were closest to Biggie during the final 18 months of his life, in and out of the studio. The result is an eight-episode visual podcast fit for a king. Welcome to season one of Iconic Records. It's one thing to be a fan of the Notorious B.I.G., but an entirely different gift to have known Christopher Wallace. Whether he was a friend, label mate, mentor, or peer, if Biggie was in your life in any capacity, you were blessed. While conducting these interviews, the toughest question I had to ask was, do you remember your last conversation with Big? What I received was a beautiful mix of shared memories from friends to bad boy staff, and we begin the finale of this ode to Big's last days with the producer of his song, Last Day. What's up, Hev? Come on in. Oh, baby, it's good to see you, man. It's been so long. Dumb long. Oof. You look the same. You look like Not, you're living good, healthy. You, you know, I'm happy. You're a little too good, but you know. Spending that rap money, <laughs> <laughs> living a good life. Yeah, you know. It's good for you, baby. Thank you. So obviously... We're celebrating B.I.G. today. Yeah, when I first came, I was like, wow, you really hooked us up. Yeah, it's nice, right? Yes. What do you think about, what's the first thing that you feel or you think about when you see this life after death? Um, the first thing, how much I miss him. Oh. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. First but that album in particular. Yeah, this one right here, because, uh, you know, I was on this album. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, and it turned out to be his last album. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I was happy I got to be a part of it. Yeah. Tell me about your relationship with him when you met him. Uh, you know, the first time I think I ever met him was we we did a couple of shows together. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Early on, Mob Deep was just coming out. Mm -hmm. Had shook ones. Big was already big. You know what I mean? And to do uh, shows with uh, B.I.G. and Junior Mafia was like, it was big for us. You know what I mean? And, um... Uh, he was real laid back and cool. Mm. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I didn't expect nothing less. Yeah. But that's how he was. Did you, um, what did you say you missed him? What do you miss about him? Those records. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Those, those, um, like the next Biggie album. Or what song are you gonna drop next? You know what I mean? Things mm -hmm. like that. It just was too early. It was Definitely way too. too early. It's crazy when we think about it. Then yeah. We all thought he was grown back then. Right. But when you think about how young he was and what he did in such a small time, it was unbelievable. It felt like a lifetime. It felt like, know, Looking yeah. back, but it was real short. Crazy. All right, so let's talk. Let's get right to your joint on this Life After Death album. <laughs> Tell me about the process of how that even happened, what the studio session was like, all of that. Well, the, the process of how it all happened, uh, you know, I started producing, of course, I was a producer for, you know, Mob Deep and, and all of that stuff, just brand new, fresh. Uh, Puff called me up one day. He was like, I, have, I need a record for Big. I was like, all right, cool. So uh, back in them days, I used to just go to the studio with a bunch of records and just, you know, make the beats in the studio, whatever. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, I made Big's beat, made it, sent it to Puff. He loved it. And um, all right, cool. So I was about to be on Big's record. I didn't know who was going to be on it or nothing like that. Just know I was going to do a record for Big. Um, by the time it came to record the record, the beat got lost. What do you mean? <laughs> Some, <laughs> somehow, <laughs> some way. Because like I said, I used to go to the studio and record on the reel. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? On you know, on the 24-inch reel. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it was on the 24-inch reel in some studio that I used to work in in Manhattan. And for some reason or the other, now when it's time for me to retrieve the reel and go hit big with the track, the reel is missing. Mysteriously missing. Did that used to happen a lot? Was that a common it, thing? It never happened. Oh, no. It, it, it never happened. So, you know, I, you know me, I'm conspiracy theorist. I'm just thinking all kinds of things. So uh, Puff was tight. He was hated. I mean, like, he was mad. He was like, yo, where's the beat I paid for? Like, straight up. And he was I'm mad like, at you? Yeah, I, who else could he be mad at? <laughs> well, it's not your fault somebody I, stole the beat. It, it is my fault. Why are you not securing the real? You know what uh. I mean? So I, I, instead of him just saying, like, you know, give me my money back or whatever, I I, I told him, I said, look, you know what I'm saying? I'll do, I do another beat similar to what whatever. So I did the beat over. The whole vibe, I let them hear it. They messed with it. And then now it's finally time to go to the studio. I go to the studio. Big is, uh, it was in daddy's house. Mm -hmm. So in daddy's house, they got like three, four different rooms in there. Yeah. And Big, what I was going to find out that day, that he would work in various rooms in one day, just going from room to room, you know, produce. You know, uh, doing a record with this producer, mm -hmm. this producer, blah blah blah, X, Y, and Z. Cause I thought that uh, Big was gonna be in the room when I got to the studio, but he wasn't. Uh. I had to go to the other room where he probably was recording with Nashim or somebody or yeah. whatever it was. Went in there, saw him. He was like on crutches at this time, like you know, he was like messed up. Mm -hmm. You know, spoke briefly, let him know, you know, I was about to go in there, get busy, or whatever, whatever. And I went in there, I started, you know, doing the new beat over and what have you. And, you know, the rest was history. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Did he come back in the room and do the verse that night? He, he never came back into the room. So wow. I didn't even hear the record until it came out. Wow. That was it. And, and <laughs> where was the, the where was the locks at in their career at that point? They was I never even heard of the locks. Oh, you didn't even know who they were. Yeah, 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 yeah. I never even I, I don't think I I heard it. You know what? I might have heard of them through Nas, but that there was just you know just small yeah, talk like tape, Yo, Puff right. got you know what I'm saying yeah, Puff yeah. got a group called the Locks or whatever. So they wasn't there. I didn't think they they was going to be on the track or, or whatever it was. But when I found found out they was going to be on the track, and when I finally heard the track. You know, they they blew me away as well. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And Big's verse? Forget about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like his verse was like, again, I didn't expect anything less. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? But since he was, you know, rhyming over the Havoc track, you know what I'm saying? He went in. Talk about like what he did to the beat. and When I finally heard what he did to the track, it was... It was better than what I expected. You yeah. know what I mean? It was. I was like, nobody could have said this. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, this is B.I.G. You know yeah. what I mean? You know, when I heard it, I was walking around the projects with my chest out. Like, you know what I'm saying? I, I still was living in the project at that time. I, you know, I didn't want to leave, but it just, man, it, that 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 boosted my confidence to have Big rapping over a track that I did. Mm -hmm. Wow. Biggie before, uh, you know, he freestyled over one of my tracks. You know what I'm saying? I think it was like one of his last freestyles where he freestyled over Hell on Earth, mm -hmm. you know, at, at a at a radio station, I believe, in L.A. And, just, you know, if I never even had gotten the chance to do a record with Big, that alone, the way he killed the Hell on Earth track, is just something to behold. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that time in New York in the, in the 90s when, when Big was, you know, crowned King of New York and that magazine cover came out and people were calling him the King of New York because now it seems like, of course, that's Big. It's, right. You know, but living in it in that time when then this, you know, New York was flooded with incredible artists yeah. at that time. Yeah. Who could have 
felt like they had at least a shot at the throne. Right. Was that a thing that would come up or or conversations that were had, maybe even your camp? You know, I... I never had no conversations with with anybody or or heard, you know, while while Big was alive, uh, anybody questioning res- questioning the fact that he was the biggest artist in New York. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it was like, all right, Big is there, and we still going to try to do our thing yeah. regardless. You know what I mean? I, I think that was the atmosphere. You know what I mean? Because who was going to go at Biggie? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like no, nobody was was gonna. Isn't be that stupid. crazy? Right. There's the way the rap game is set up that everybody is, everybody thinks they're the best rapper alive, right? right? If right. you're not a, you're not in the rap game, if you don't think you're the best rapper, especially exactly. then. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you gotta think that you're the best. You yeah. Know what I'm you gotta know that you're the best. Yeah. You know what I mean? But nobody ain't stupid. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> ain't nobody gonna be like, you know what? Let me just test. Big's gangster real quick. You know what I mean? In New York. Nah, nobody wanted that smoke. <laughs> no, nobody wanted that smoke. That was that was like career suicide right there. Like for real. I ain't even trying to, you know what I'm saying, be a rider or nothing like that. But it, the atmosphere was just crazy. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Remember back then in the clubs and you know what I'm saying, how they was playing his songs, how they they had the radio on a lot. You know what I'm saying? He couldn't miss. Everything was a hit. Mm-hmm. Come on. Did you ever get to party with Big? I like I said, you know, we did shows mm-hmm. with with him. That was the closest we got mm-hmm. to partying. You know, they, you know, but his, his parties was was you know, opulence. You know what I'm saying? It's like it was on the the next level. I they had to be the first to do it like that. You know what I'm saying? To to mix, you know, say music and fashion on a high level. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And have everybody like, yeah, I'm I, I'm fly. You know, so I never got a chance to party party with him, but. I felt like I did. <laughs> we, all, we all kind of felt like we did, right? <laughs> Anybody ever feel a way about, you know, it was a, lot, it was a competitive time. And some people may yeah. have been competition with with Big. They would always put him up against Nas, who's the greatest. And, yeah. Was there any ever a weird kind there, of energy around producer for there, other folks? There was never, ever even a weird second about me doing a record for Big. Because everybody, you know, you, got it, you out here, you... You out here, we getting money. We doing what we do. I'm a producer slash rapper, whatever. You a rapper, okay, do what you do. Mm-hmm. You know, um, if I was ever around. And because, and trust me, I knew both of them. You know what I mean? I knew the Wu-Tang because we was label mates and Nas because we grew up with each other and mm-hmm. we from Queensbridge. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, those little, um, how can I call it, subliminals that they was going through, you know, nah. Every time when I was around Ray, Ray and them, they treated me like, they little brother, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Nice. So when I seen him, it was all good. They never ever even put me in the middle of anything like that because, you know, they always knew me as somebody that was neutral. Mm-hmm. Do you remember what your last conversation was with Big? We ask everybody that who's come. Oh uh, man, you know the last conversation I had with him was the like pretty much that first time I was in the studio with him. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like oh. You can't, he's like, yo, good looking out for coming through. Thank you. You know what I'm saying? Watch what I'm going to do to that track. You know what I mean? And and that's just the last thing I remember, which, you know, I feel that that was a blessing. Even though it was only that, that I got to hear from him, those, you know, few words, I could take that and hold on to it. I know you spent a lot of time with him in his career, you know, throughout the stages. Was he open right away to you? Did that take time to to get his trust? What was he like as a subject for you? Because, you know, on the radio, I mean, with me on the radio, it was different. He was, it was jolly and fun. I wasn't necessarily, like, getting into, like, the serious kind of interview with him. He's my favorite interview of all time. Yeah. Um, just because he was funny. He would, he was self-deprecating. He would kind of just react. He would, he, he would never say no. Like, no matter what question you asked, no matter how hard a question was, he just had a sense of humor about it. But then at the same time, he would give you these great answers. And, you know, he would end up giving me, he would tell me these stories that years later I ended up, you know, putting in the movie Notorious. What can you say about the evolution of like, um, just the evolution of him as a person, as a man, as a, you know, we hear a lot of stories about how he, towards the end, you know, he was a baby too. He was 20, you know, 22, 23, 24, but 
even yeah. at that young age, he had evolved where he started, you know, really trying to set up his family. You yeah. know, he had gotten married. He was trying to, he just was shifting a little bit. And I know you saw a lot of phases of him. I wonder what, what if you had any thoughts about that. Well, we just had conversations about that evolution, you know, because the very first time I talked to him, which is when I talked about being on St. James, which was uh, late August, early September of, of 94, he said that he was afraid to leave the block because he was afraid of how it would affect his music. His whole life was waking up smelling Chinese food, you know, um, from, from down the street, hearing, you know, car horns and gunshots and then hip hop. That was his whole life. And that was all that he thought about. And he thought that he needed that environment, you know, to kind of create the way that he created. Right. Flash forward two and a half years later, I'm interviewing him over the whole month of of um, February and part of and part of March, pretty much up until two days before he gets murdered. And the first time we talk, he's poolside um, at the Four Seasons in a cabana. And you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's a different and, big. And he's talking about how, like, he can rhyme about anything, anywhere, at any time. And I think the thing for him was that he just, as his life evolved, he really wanted to capture where he was in his life. Because Ready to Die was written from the perspective of somebody that was going all out and was ready to die for, you know, what he felt was important. I, I, I never really understood what Puffy did. Everyone says, what does what does Puffy really do? Once I became a showrunner for Luke Cage, I finally understood what, what Puffy does. <laughs> and what Puffy does is he pushes everybody around them to create the environment he has in his head and the structure of a story that's being told. And with the drama of, of a movie. And then Big, of course, is is just the way that he writes and the way that he puts things together. He's just a natural storyteller. And so it's almost like, you know, Puff is like Scorsese and Biggie's like Robert De Niro. And together, they're, they're, they're giving you Casino. They're giving you Goodfellas. They're, they're giving you these movies that just... But then Biggie is also writing the script in his head and, and kind of seeing it out. And so at first, for Ready to Die, that was the story of a young man who, you know, is so sick of who it is he's become because of the environment that he's grown up in. He kills yeah. himself at the, end, at the end of the record, suicidal thoughts. Life after death is a lot more metaphorical. The way that he described in the, in the interview we had was, I'm not on, on some killing myself. You know, life after death, even though he has a record saying you're nobody till somebody kills you, Big had no feelings that he was going to get murdered or, or die. You don't His think so? His whole thing was, nah. Mm -hmm. This, it was an extension of the character that he was building. Because mm -hmm. this was really supposed to be, you know, a different Big. He said that, like, he couldn't rhyme about the block anymore he wanted to rhyme about what it was like to have money and still have the block mentality and more money more problems and how and how like all these different things kind of come at you after tupac was murdered and about a day or so after sees and it was a there, there was a car accident because sees was driving it was bad weather conditions and they were in a, in a loaner from a car dealership it was um biggie charlie baltimore and C's in a car. C's was driving because Big couldn't drive. They, they, the car flipped. Mm -hmm. Big broke his leg in a couple of places. And then he ended up going to the Kessler, um, this rehabilitation place um, in New Jersey. I never realized he went there. I went there. I had a bad car accident a few years ago and I had to go there. It's not a, it's not a fun place to be. Yeah. Um, Is and that he where was you there. saw him? No, I didn't you see him. him. He talked oh, about uh. it. And when, and when he talked about it, he said, he said that this person would like some one of the orderlies would always come by his room and would say to him, like, you know, because he was he was literally bedridden. He was you know, he couldn't walk. He was his leg was in traction. The person said to him, said, look, you know, when you can walk, all you think about is what's ahead of you. But when you're stuck in a bed looking at the ceiling and this is big describing this. All you can think about is everything that you did in your life, right, wrong, good, bad. And you just stare mm -hmm. at the ceiling, staring at your life and thinking about who it is you are and what it is you want to do. And he, and he said, you know, this is the time to really, the, wow. this is just, just, just a guy that cleaned his room. And you just said that. It was one of those things where Big talked about how it just like blew his mind. And he just started thinking about his life. And a lot of the things he started thinking about was the good, the bad mistakes, you know, the things he wanted to change. And a lot of that introspection 
is reflected in life after death. And that was the thing. Mm. This was again, another metaphor of, okay, I, I got killed off and ready to die. And now there is a life after death. And in that life there's more money, more problems. You know, there are all the, you know, there's beef, there's, there's all these different issues and I'm going to write about those and have fun with that. But at the same time, also have a record like sky's the limit, you know, and there's hopeful. records that are a lot more, you know, um, hopeful, hopeful. Mm-hmm. and introspective and that was this whole thing was he was really trying to you know on all levels elevate everything he was trying to make the biggest rap record of all time understanding that he was going to be worth a lot more money than he already had he already was trying to you know move to atlanta you know he wanted to have a big house um the the faith thing was tricky he he ultimately said that like he thought they would get back together, but then at the same time, you know, moving like you said, crazy fast. And, he was also, um, by the way, twenty four. Yeah, that was the craziest thing. The conversation that we had the day before he was murdered, he went and he was so deeply introspective. He talked about that. He talked about um, the the palm, the Psalm, I think twenty two or twenty seven. Um, yeah, that pattern. <laughs> It's on 27. Like he he talked about like all these different things. That was really the biggest thing was that. And this again, it's just something that kind of fucks me up when I think about it. We weren't supposed to have our last conversation because he was supposed to go straight from the American Music Awards to the airport to fly to London. And he just decided at the last minute that he didn't want to go because he said he was in California. The the, the weed was positive and the women was positive and he just wanted to chill. And that was why ultimately he didn't end up flying out. And I got that last conversation. Um, and we were at at the Sunset and at the Westwood Marquee. That was that was a hotel. It's, it's now the uh, W Westwood. And I'll never forget going downstairs and watching him get into the green suburban and um i'll just never forget that because ultimately a day a day later that was that was the car he was murdered in and so i saw him get in get in the car he said all right chael and then um i just remember just saying all right and that was it you know um Mm. it was just one of those things where it's just i'll never really i'll never forget that um one of my favorite books is the autobiography of Malcolm X. And that was when Alex Haley had the chance to really sit with Malcolm X and, and have these conversations that ultimately became that book. And that's in a weird way. That's what it felt like. My conversations with, with Biggie were like, it didn't feel like I was writing an article for vibe. It didn't feel like I was writing an article for the LA times. It felt like he was talking to me for a bigger piece, like a book. And so that's why, I wrote Unbelievable, The Life, Death, and Afterlife, The Notorious B.I.G., because the interviews that he gave me were so introspective and they were so about much more than the music that I felt like I, it was a responsibility to, to, you know, to write that book and ultimately to be a part of the movie. Producer Easy Mo B was one of Big's most frequent collaborators, as was DJ Clark Kent. Both producers, along with Mike B, remember their last conversation with the notorious one. Mr. Mo B. What's happening, And Oh my God, I haven't seen you probably since 90 something. No, no, it was 2000s. <laughs> Not quite that long. <laughs> no, it's um, been a long time. So we're celebrating this Life After Death album. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, looking at the, I'm looking at the artwork right now. When you see the artwork, when you see that cover of Big and that hearse, what, what, what does that bring up for you? I think I told this story before, mm-hmm. but it definitely deserves to be told again. Um, I showed up at Daddy's house. Puff arranged a session for me to come in and track those two beats, going back to Cali, and um, I love the dope. I showed up, I got there on time or a little early, and R. Kelly was in the studio. And he was recording the um, "Fing You Tonight joint. And so I came in, and when I was on the side, he was doing his thing. Then finally he came over. He was like, yo, what's up, man? How you doing? He said, yo, man, if you don't mind, you know, we running over a little bit. I just want to finish. I said, nah, nah, bro. Go ahead, do your thing. So after he finished, then D-Dot, he commenced to set me up because D-Dot was the engineer. 
okay, we started to track the beats, got them to the point of like finally mixed, where Big could just go in the booth and work with them. So when Big finally got there, maybe an hour or so or something like that later, he showed up with Jay, Jay Z. And he came over to me and it's like, yo, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put Jiggle on one of these joints. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so me and D Dot, we had already got the beats mixed and to the point where they could do the vocals to it. And Big did some of his usual thing that I saw him do a lot. He usually was on the couch. He had this thing where he used to twiddle his thumbs. <laughs> big, he was big, so he just like rock side to side, be twiddling his thumbs. But today, with Jada in the studio, the two of them was just like walking back and forth, mumbling to themselves. Yo, picture this, picture <laughs> this, Ange. They was they was pacing, but in crisscross mode. Like Big's walking this way, Jay's walking this way toward each other. They walk to the end of the room and come back <laughs> and they both like so, 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 so. and they did that for a while then Biggie came over to me and he said you see yo yo mo man me and Jigga word for word I remember that as his exact words he said Jigga he said yo what up mo me and Jigga we gonna step out we'll be back so I'm like okay um I waited until that was around probably about eight, maybe nine o'clock. I waited in the studio to about as much as maybe about two in the morning. And then that's when I told D Dot, I said, Yo, I got another session. I got something to do in the morning. I got to bounce. I said, So, um, Half Puff, let me know what the next session is. He's like, All right, Mo, peace. Um, I never ever got the call for that next session. But I'm saying that to say that was my last time that I saw Big. Oh. His last words to me was, yo, Mo, me and Jigga, we going to step out. I'll be back. And that was it. Wow. Uh, wow. Do you remember the last conversation you had with Big? Absolutely. You do? Uh, yes. Because earlier in the day, I was at his hotel. And he's like, yo... I'm going to the party tonight, to the vibe party tonight. And I was just like, why? I said, dog, stay low. I like, nah, you know, I'm, I'm gonna get out and puff me. I was like, all right, cool, I'll be there. So I'm there and I don't know what happened to me, but I bought 17 bottles of champagne and I didn't drink one glass. I just was sharing it with people. Like there's video footage of me dancing with champagne bottles at the party. And at one point, it's, he's sitting at the table, me, Puff, him, Andre, and I'm sitting right next to Andre, and he's right next to me, and he goes, yo, I need you to come to Europe, or come to London with me. When the album drop, we're gonna do this London tour. I need you to come with me. And I was like, dog, you know I literally just got hired to Motown Records. I, I'm working with Andre, I'm the vice president over there. And he goes, nah, man, I need you to go. So I turned to Andre. I don't even know what made me do this. But I was just like, yo, Big wants me to go to London with him, you know, when the album dropped. He was like, go! He said, if you're hot, we hot! I was like, okay, we're gonna go. And then we sat for a while. And I was, he was like, I was like, where are you going after this? He was like, I heard Tony Polk's having a party. I was like, yeah, I'm going to the party. And that was the last of it. Mm. And, and, uh, and uh, I'm at the Tony Polk party and somebody goes, yo, your man got shot. I was like, who? He was like, big. I'm like, you sound stupid. I'm like, nah, your man's at Cedar Sinai. Or Cedar. I think it was Cedar Sinai. I was the name of the hospital, right? Mm -hmm. So it's funny because I went to the party with two of my guys and I left them there. Like I just, like, because I was outside of the party when they when they said it. And I just, I just walked to my car and just got in the car and drove and went to the hospital. And everybody was outside like, nah, he died. And I was like, mm -hmm. So I called Jay and he was like, yeah, I, I just heard from somebody. I didn't believe it was true either. And I, I just, it was incredible to me because um, we were just 
talking about going to London. And I was like, I got the okay from the boss. He's like, yeah, go ahead. And then, and then that, and, uh, that was a really ill night because if you know the building, it has a drive through from one side of the street to another street. It's like the driveway where you park your car or, or you, where you jump out and get your car parked. And then you turn this way. And as you go that way, you get to Wilshire or you could turn this way and get to Wilshire. My car was pointed that way. His car was pointed that way. I go to Wilshire. I turn left because now we're going to go up into the hills. And I'm at the light. And his car is pulling up. And all of a sudden, you hear the shots. You from New York, you hear shots. You drive. You get out of there. My light turned green. I go. I'm not knowing that they're shooting at him until I get to where I'm at. And I'm just like, damn. If I, like... I, if I knew, I wouldn't have left, but I was like, what? Yeah, it was, it was, it was a rough, rough, very rough moment. But the last conversation was, I'm going to go on the road with you to London and we're going to do these promo shows. Wow. Yeah. Do you remember your last conversation with Big? The last time you talked to him? My last conversation with Big. Well, the last time I spoke with Big, wasn't really a conversation. The last conversation I had with Big was probably um, the night of the car accident. I had to babysit Big in the hospital. I was the one that was watching Big and, and C's in the hospital. Wow. But C's had just lost his fronts. So, you know, once they, you know, fix C's up or whatever, you know, me and him is running around the hospital bugging out and all of that. But, you know, I was there at the hospital I had to watch, I don't want to say babysitting, but yeah. I had to hold big down that night. And it was just me and C's in the hospital that night. So that night, you know, I'm just like really just like kicking it with him. And that's where, you know, I started to see more of the humbleness mm. because I know this man was in such pain, right? There was a point where he was like, he was like, yo, Mike B. I was like, yo, I'm right here. He's like, yo, I need more morphine, bro. This is starting to wear off. But he's not like, ooh, uh, uh, yeah, right, right, right. he's just like, yo, B, this is crazy right now. And they, they won't let me smoke my cron. And yo, this is crazy. <laughs> yo, what am I supposed to do? Yo, call Duke. Tell Duke to come in. I was like, all right, all right, all right. So when they come in, you know, they do whatever they do. But yeah, that was crazy. Wow. So, so. So that night of the accident, a lot of folks don't know, C's was driving mm -hmm. and he went into hydroplane, right? So Was it raining? It was raining that mm -hmm. night. And he went into hydroplane and they crashed, they hit a guardrail and C's must have hit his fronts on the steering wheel and somehow Big broke his thigh bone. How does a big cat like that break his thigh bone? You know what I'm saying? So... That's what he's talking about when he's saying, um, um, I used to be as strong as Ripple B till little C's crippled me. Now I stay hard like your girl's nipples be. Y'all know the rules. Went from BK to New Jerusalem. Thinking about all the planes we flew. We ran through. Now the game's new. I lay my game flat. I want my spot back. So now he's... He's starting to, he's letting you know how confident he's feeling about his He's telling y'all like, yo, yeah, all right, ready to die was number one. Y'all up with that. Y'all didn't, didn't really believe in me on ready to die. But now he's like, yo, man, listen, man, I want my spot back. Take two, double album, mm -hmm. take two. You know what I'm saying? Because Bones Malone said, sometimes... Uh, there were things that Big said in his lyrics that he didn't want to hear. And he would, like, complain to Big about it. Like, don't say that. Um, he didn't get specific about which lyrics they were, but there were lines that bothered him, right? I was high when they hit me. I took a few cats with me. He also said, um... He also said, um... Mom, mom crouched up over the casket screaming bastard. Y'all know who filled him. He's telling you. Y'all know who killed me. He's putting it out there. Yeah. You understand what did I'm that, saying? Did that energy, did you feel that energy? Were you concerned about that energy? Because 
this was a theme for, for I was me. I was concerned about the energy be, only because I'm a, I'm a Gemini. I, I feel energy. Mm -hmm. and, and the Jamaican in me, like, I'm a very spiritual person the way I was raised. So it's like, you know, it's like feeling that energy. And then after the shoot, you see all these pictures. He's next to the hearse. He's leaning next to the hearse. Then he's in the, there's other pics where he's in the cemetery. Then he's by a mausoleum. And, and I was just like, damn. I was like, crazy. Sure. I wasn't in LA when, when Big left. I was supposed to actually meet Jay Black and all of them in London because at this time... Big was supposed to go to London. He was supposed to go to yeah. London and do Tim Westwood and all of that. Mm -hmm. At this time, I was staying in ATL. My grandmother had also passed. At this time, rest in peace, I was staying with Wolf in Atlanta. Wow. Um, 112's manager was like my big bro. So... um. So it was, it was, you know, something had went down in, in my own hood with, with a couple of my own personal homies. So when I got to one of my men's crib, and it was like, yo, you heard about your boy? Your boy got hit last night. Boom, boom, boom. I think he died. And I'm thinking they talking about one of my men that I grew up with. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I just, I just saw him. Like, I just left him. Like, how did you just leave him? They was in L.A. And I was like, whoa, whoa, wait up, hold on. What are you talking about? He goes, yo, your boy Big. And I was like, what? He was like, yo. I was like, no, 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 chill. I don't even want to hear it right now. I called Black. I called Jay Black. And all I could hear in the background was literally the sound of like, as if it was like babies, like literally crying. And it was Ella Wax in the background crying. Grown men, like, bawling. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, nah, Black, what are you, what's, what's going on? He's like, yo, B, son ain't with us, son left. And I was like, I was like, damn, I, I dropped the phone and all of that. It was crazy. That was, that was, that was crazy. That was crazy. To get a truly accurate picture of the man that was Christopher Wallace, speak with the women in his life. Yes, he was a true player for real. But that's not where his character ends. He was a provider, protector, and a life changer for so many. We conclude season one of Iconic Records with the testimonies of former executive assistant to Sean Combs, Leote Blacknor, 5001 Flavors, Shireen Wood, and the little brother that Big never had, Little C's. Oh, Leote. Oh, Angie. This woman <laughs> has survived being Puff's assistant in the 90s. Yes. How are you? Are you okay? <laughs> I am okay. I am alive and doing well and super blessed. Yeah, no, yes. what, a, what a time, huh? There's all types of talk about Big with the ladies that he was like, you know, everybody always know. everybody knows this about him. Was he like that with the, like what was what was his energy with the women in the office? Because there were a lot of women around. Yeah, right? we were yeah. all women, uh, with the exception of a few men. But in terms of like that front office support, it, it was a lot of us. The one thing I have to say as well is that he was very respectful. Mm. You know, that's a different kind of energy when you're around a man, particularly in these days, right? And how that landscapes kind of shifted a little bit. Yeah. Like I always felt okay around him. I never felt like I'd be violated. He was very respectful and mannerable. Um, and that's why I feel like, you know, we wanted to reciprocate that same kind of energy and just, I mean, yeah. we didn't have a nine to five. So you were either in it or you weren't. Yeah. You know, this wasn't a lifestyle. This is, you know, who we were. We were, you know, building a culture um, that was primarily predicated on our passion for music, our passion for, you know, pushing culture forward, but also our passion for wanting to win and wanting to see him as well as some of the, you know, not even some, but you know, the rest of our artists, win. you know, win I love on the label. You, I love that you said that about him because sometimes people could mistake um, like somebody who's nice, great with the women as being like, um, you know, not great for other women to be around. Right. Nah, but he wasn't we never that. felt that way. No, we right. never felt that way. Never. If anything, you know, 
particularly in, in, in my case, you know, I felt somewhat protected. By big. By him, but also protective, you know, of him, which is why I made the um, conscious decision when we lost him. Um, there was a part of me that felt a little lost um, because, you know, I felt like there was a price that he had to pay in just a very vicious world. Um, and so t to continue my passion, um, I decided to leave Bad Boy and um, become the general manager of entertainment with his best friend, Lance on Rivera. Take me back to the, though being a woman in that office in that time. I mean, I was a woman on the radio at that time. Right. So, I, you know, I can kind of relate, but you were in the actual hub of where all this stuff was going on. I don't know. I, you know, if I self diagnose myself through like some form of PTSD, there's a lot of things that I just block out. Mm -hmm. And then there's just a lot of things that I don't immerse myself in. So, I don't really watch like biggie documentaries or biopics. I'm just mm. my whole family is 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 from Cali. And so I've been going to Cali as a little black girl from Queens basically all my life. And you know, I gotta tell you, that was the longest <laughs> LA flight coming back from JFK. Not, you know, I mean, you know, that night I almost got in the car with them because at the time I wasn't driving. So once again, this is me just kind of hustling, hopping in, you know, any kind of car to, you know, go over, go wherever. Um, but I think like anything else, you, you have to approach the trauma where you don't let it overwhelm you. But you can't roll over it either. I mean, no, you can't, was, yeah. you can't. Um, what could you tell us about that time? Like, when did you, were you, you were at the party, right? You were there. Yeah. 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 You know, back then we were always subjected to rumors. So um, I was, you know, my pager was going off like crazy, just, you know, random numbers or, and then, you know, other number codes rather that I was familiar with. And I had made it back to um, my hotel. And so, um, you know, I made a phone call <clears throat> and... Um, you know, I said, hey, you know, I heard that there was an incident. You know, is this true? Because I'm hearing it from more than, you know, one source. And uh, they were like, yeah, you got to get to the hospital. So I just remember going down, like just running downstairs and, and going to the hospital. And um, nobody was really there yet. Um, but as soon as I hopped out, I saw Ed Lover. And, uh, you know, I gave him a hug and then I went to, you know, try to get in the hospital and the cop said, are you his wife? And I said, no, I'm not, but, you know, I'm, I'm Puff's assistant and I need to. And he was like, sorry, no one is allowed except the spouse. And I was like, well, can you tell me what's going on? No, I can't. Only the spouse. And then I'll never forget, Ed Lovell was like, um... If anybody else, like outside of the spouse and family, you need to let her in. And so, you know, the cop, I guess, just could tell, like, the look on my face. So I go in and, you know, I don't know. I don't want to. Mm -hmm. It's okay. No, it's okay. You don't have to do that. We ask everybody who does uh, mm -hmm. does these interviews, do you remember the last time you spoke to Big? Well, the last time I actually saw him, we were looking over the Life After Death um, album package, which I did not like. I thought it was too sad. Um, I have a few original images of him actually standing next to a tombstone. And so I was like, we just had these great conversations about all the stuff you're doing. And this is making me sad. He's like, I'm an artist. Like, this is what I'm doing. Um, so that's the last time I actually saw him. I, we thought we were, he was going to London. About two weeks before he left, he had ordered a bunch of clothes um, and we needed to get some of it ready because now he was going to California. 
I was a little bit apprehensive, but I, you know, I packaged it together. I sent it out to him. Um, March 9th, our other partner calls me. He's like, Big is pissed. He's looking for you. His clothes didn't get there. And I'm like, I checked. Like, I confirmed it was received. He's like, well, he doesn't have any clothes. You need to call him. So I'm trying to make sure that it, it was received. Call the concierge who had left. I had to get the bellboy to go out. The package was sitting in the office. So we found the package. I had somebody take it up. I had put it under Frank White because that's that was the alias that they gave me. You know, sometimes I send it in a different name. So it's coming upstairs. I call him. I said, "Big, your clothes are coming. Don't worry." He was pissed. So he's very at this point very particular about his look. You know, if if his clothes aren't right, he doesn't want to go. He'll pitch it a little fit. His clothes came. Um, I went to bed. Everything was fine. I said, "I'll see you." Um, you know, later. I called and confirmed the package was delivered. The concierge had it. They were going to bring it up to him. So now he had clothes. This is March 8th. This is March 8th. Um, and so I didn't think anything of it. You know, I'm in East Coast. I'm tired. I had a long day. So I spoke to him and I literally um, um, hung up the phone once I, once I confirmed that the package was there. He left. And I literally went to sleep. <laughs> so the next call I get was from Guy. And I was still kind of groggy. Now it's March 9th, it's early in the morning, and I literally pick up my phone. I don't even, you know, I'm not even up. And he he asked me a question, and I thought he asked me, did I get big? Because I was trying to make sure he, you know, got the clothes. And I said, sure, I spoke to him last night, and he was crying. He said, they shot big. And I was like, no, no, no. Like, in my mind, I had literally just spoken to him. I hung up the phone, and I pressed redial because I know that I just dialed. And I asked the front desk, I gave him the room number, and he started to say something, just put me through. Kept ringing, it kept ringing. I was like, no, I, ju- I literally just spoke to him. Like, to me, I hadn't even been asleep. I called the front desk back, and a guy was crying. They shot him, they shot him. And I was like, what do you mean they shot him? So for years in my mind, if that box hadn't got to him, he wouldn't have went out because he didn't have any clothes. And so it was like really hard for me to listen to his music too, knowing that he didn't really want to go to California, knowing that he was going to London, knowing that he didn't want to be there. It it just pissed me off. Mm. Um, So of all the things for a carrier to lose, I wish they would have lost that box, Mm. but they didn't. Mm. And you know, he always said that he knew he was going to die young. And I said, stop saying that. But he always said that. Um, And so this year, I spoke to CJ, um, his son, and I said, CJ, you are older than your dad was when he passed away. Um, CJ turned 25 this year, Big Mm -hmm. turned 50. And I was like, and that's the legacy that he wanted. And he always talked about his son. His son was young, you know, when he passed away. Mm -hmm. But now to see CJ older than Big was, he was like, you know, when I think about it, I I didn't realize the impact that he had in 24 years. Right. Because I'm just starting my life, and his life was everything at 24. Mm-hmm. And so it is, it is really sad because I, I love working with our clients because we get to see unsigned hype to stardom. So mm-hmm. I saw that rise with some of our clients is longer. But to know that there's a legacy that's still going on, his songs get more airplay than some current artists, mm-hmm. that's what he wanted. And so I'm happy and proud for him because he didn't know, but he, he did build a legacy. Even right. though he thought he didn't, he did. You know? Yeah, I know this was really hard for God because, like I said, two weeks before he died, he ordered a bunch of stuff, and he was like, "I'm gonna need a white suit." And I was like, "You just we just did hypnotize." He said, "That's cream, mm. that's not white." Yeah. So he ordered this white suit. It sat there. We didn't send it, and it wound up being a suit that he was buried in. Totally. And out. so that was yeah. a little scary for me. So it sat there for a long time. And then after he passed away, Faith called and was like, I think I want to bury him in a white suit. I didn't, I, I lost it. Yeah. The guy lost it because ultimately Big had ordered the suit that he was going to be buried in and it was already ready. Mm. I heard y'all went to see the casino in the middle of a session. Yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> then- I mean, matter of fact, I'm going to tell you one story, right? When he did the, the, the verse for the uh, Benjamin's verse, mm-hmm. Undercover Donnie Brasco, you know, that verse he did right before he got killed. Like, he did that for Puff, right? It's when he supposedly went to London, we didn't go. And he kept saying, yo, Puff, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go to London. Like, everybody couldn't go because everybody's passports wasn't right. 
We couldn't go. And I, want, I always want to clear that up because I, everybody was like, yo, Puff made him stay there. No, he, no, he didn't want to go. Mm. And these are things that I know from him and I put that on my man's grave. Cross my heart, hope to die. He didn't want to go because only me and him could go. And he was like, yo, who's going to do my airport? Who's going to get my hotel room? Lil C's? Seven, like, he's going to be my manager? Because his manager couldn't go. D-Rock couldn't go. Nobody couldn't go. So he said, yo, Puff, I would do anything not to go. And Puff was like, yo, all right, well, just stay here and just whatever you want to do and work. All right, I work. And he went, we went to the movies to go see Donnie Brasco. And he, we went to the studio from there. He put that in the rhyme. Wow. This is, this is straight fact. You can ask D-Rock. You can ask anybody. This is no lies. <laughs> you know what I mean, no. So I hate when people like try to throw that on on Puff, and you know, mm -hmm. like, nah, it wasn't that. Puff ain't trying to keep him there. Big didn't want to go because Big didn't have nobody to actually go with him mm -hmm. to actually monitor him because all of us had jail records and we was all felons and <laughs> nobody could go with him. And he Basically, didn't want to go to London. Can't go. Money L can't but, go. But but was it true that he was uncomfortable being in L.A.? Nah, he stayed there for two months. We was there for two months. That ain't happened three days or a week. We was there for damn near three months. Some people, some some of the, in the, some of the chats, people are saying, but we're saying that that was his way of show, trying to get things back to normal. Of course, he yeah. was just really just trying to, you know, he was trying to just like get people to stop thinking about that. And you know, it's love and it's cool. But at the end of the day, he was the culprit. He was the boss. We did everything he said. If he wanted to be out there, we stand out there, point blank, period. No matter how we felt, I could have told him a hundred times, yo, be out, let's go home. If he say, yo, nah, little bro, we staying, all right? We staying. <laughs> it's that simple. Yeah. I'm here on the strip for him, so if you want to be here, bro, I'm here. But I know his attentions was there to, ah, he, he loved it. He made a record about that. Going back to Cali, he loved it. He knew it wasn't a L.A. thing. Nah, we had a situation with a certain group of people. That's what it was. Vice versa. You know what I mean? Pac or Death Row come to New York, they, the whole city don't hate them. They have problems with a certain group of people. That don't mean they can't come out there and hang out with nobody. It's just what the world was. It wasn't no thing like that. And Big felt like it was his thing to just try to fix it. Like, yo, you know what? What's happening right now is not a good thing. He knew his attentions was great, and he was pure about it, and he was just trying to fix things. It's not wasn't why he was out there like, yo, I'm just trying to fix. No, my, his thing was, I'm working, but you know what? At the end of the day, whatever y'all think is that, it's not that. And I thought that was real brave of him, just to be humble enough to be like, yo, nah, I ain't. He was playing the cool role. I've, you know, a lot of New York people felt like he's playing the sucker role. Yo, mm. dog, nah. Brooklyn, he like, yo, nah, it ain't that. That was actually my friend, bro. We're not doing that. He stood down actually for something he shouldn't have stood down for. From my point of view. But that's what he was. Cause he that's what that's what he was about. Cause he knew what he was true in his heart. He knew what he didn't do. He knew what he had nothing to do with. And he was just like, yo, I'm just trying to spread the love. That was his thing. Spread love was the Brooklyn way. We've asked everybody this. It might be a little sensitive for you, but we, we asked everybody if they remember their last uh, conversation with Big. My last? Do you remember it? Yeah. When we was leaving the um, museum, we was playing going back to Cali. And we was leaving out the parking lot. And Rock had, uh, D Rock had like smacked, like grabbed his head and was like, you know, you back, bro, you back. Cause you know, at one, at one time, Big just felt like, you know, he didn't feel the scars, but you know, it was that sophomore jinx, like I right, second hour around going on. And uh, we was playing the going back to Cali song. And I, the last, his last words to me was like, yo, we good? You got something? And I was like, yeah, we good. We good. Like, you know, like, I got somebody to come hang out with us tonight. And I was just pulling out that spot. And we pulled out the red light. 
we got out the parking lot and we got to the red light. That's when all this. So that's like my last, like, you know, the last type of words we had with each other. Do you ever think about, I mean, just how that you, you could have been, you could have not been there. Yeah. Yeah. Or you could have still been beefing. Yeah. That would have, you know what I mean? That you had the, you were able to. I kind of wish I, you know. I don't. I don't never. I never thought about it like that. The way you asked me that, because nobody never asked me that like that. But you know, maybe I wish I won it. You know, that really f with me for the rest of my life. You know, hearing about it might be a little different than seeing it. Mm. You know, I never really been through nothing like that with none of my homeboys. The way you actually see it happen. I was 17 years old and I was behind him in the back seat. You know, sometimes I wish if God could have twisted it, I wish I could have took a few of those or maybe he would be alive or maybe I could have been. Who knows how it worked? You can't judge God mm -mm. and how he put things together, or how he situate things. And, you know, you know, so for a long time, I had to sit with that, you know, like, damn, you know, I, I was right behind him. And I don't like saying that, because I don't like pushing that, but I was literally right behind him. And he was in the passenger seat. I was in that seat behind him. You know, it's a, you know, I'll live with that. I gotta live with that. That's the one day I won't forget for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. But at least y'all were good. I was there for that. You know what? I was there from the beginning, and I was there to the end, and I'm cool with that. I gotta imagine that he's probably very proud of you, see? I'm proud of him. <laughs> Super proud of him. I love him. Man. Oh, you know, amazing. I got work to do, but you know, I still, you know, I appreciate him for changing my life. And you here, baby? Yeah, we here. <laughs> I love you, C's. Voice New York all day.